My name is Chelsea Boudou. I am a coordinator for GARD, and I'm so glad to have you all today. Uh, please let me know if you need anything. Before we get started with Chosen uh, from the Union of Concerned Scientists, I'm going to share a quick video uh, from our sponsors. All right, uh, so Tosin is with the Union of Concerned Scientists. We are so happy to have you here today. Uh, Tosin, would you like to first tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Thank you. Yes, I am getting my PowerPoint. Yeah, no worry, you are muted though. I just wanna let you know about that. <laughs> So right now we can, yeah, you should swap that. Great. Awesome. All right. Can everyone see clearly and hear me? Awesome. Great. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Tosin Fide, and I'm an outreach coordinator at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, I'll share more about UCS. Um, Sorry, my, there's so many things. Okay, <laughs> I'll share more about UCS and my work. Um, but first I wanted to talk a little bit more about my background. Um, so before I came to UCS, I was working in biosecurity and biodefense um, doing different projects when I uh, completed grad school. And my work was centered around ensuring the security of our high level safety laboratories um, that carry biological pathogens. Um, and I worked to ensure that uh, the safety levels were adequate enough to prevent accidental or non-accidental exposures of those dangerous pathogens to the public. So while working to keep laboratories secure is for the greater good, uh, we definitely want to learn, I definitely wanted to learn more about what policy means for the everyday person who doesn't work in the laboratory. Um, that's the most vulnerable and historically excluded communities that need to be adequately represented both in the scientific workforce, um, in academia, and um, in constituents that are helping to inform policy. So a little bit about UCS. Um, at UCS, we put rigorous science to work to, put, to build a healthier planet and a safer and more just world. In today's polarized political environment, UCS leads with solutions around the response to the climate crisis, reduction of oil usage, investment and promotion of renewable energy, reducing the threat of nuclear weapons and war, building a healthier and more accessible food system, um, and many more issues, including environmental justice. We believe that scientific analysis, not political calculations or corporate hype, should guide government policies. Our staff includes scientists, engineers, economists, um, and analysts. Um, we mobilize some of the nation's top scientists, and we have a network of over half a million members and supporters. We also deploy uh, the UCS Science Network, where we mobilize some 20,000 scientists um, and technical experts all over the country to take action. I will share a little bit about what I do at UCS. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a senior outreach coordinator on our science network team. Um, what is the science network? So the science network is a community of about 24,000 scientists and technical experts who have committed to using their expertise to advocate for science. This network of engaged and active scientists, engineers, and public health officials work to inform decisions that are critical to our health, safety, environment in several ways. Um, that could be by uh, planning events, leading trainings, um, speaking on panels, providing um, expert testimony in front of Congress, 
uh, providing written testimony for hearings, uh, several different ways to do that. The Science Network activates the scientific community about the impacts that science can have in the public sphere by getting them involved in advocacy and policy. And our Science Network vision, we strive towards a functioning just democracy where all voices are heard, everyone has access to information about issues that shape their lives, all constituents can shape policy decisions that affect our lives, and communities most impacted by societal problems have a role in um, building the solutions. So if you're interested in learning more about the Science Network, um, all of you would be Science Network eligible. Um, that includes a variety of scientific disciplines, um, including the social scientists, sciences, the political sciences, um, engineering. Um, I encourage you to sign up to receive our resources as well as some updates and opportunities um, where you can advocate for science and collaborate with us. So you can join at www.ucsusa.org slash science network. Uh, we're also on Twitter at SciNetUCS. And you can also send us an email at science network at ucsusa.org. Uh, we hope you join us. So let's dive right in uh, to the workshop, talking up without talking down. So conveying scientific concepts to non-scientific audiences requires a personal approach. Um, and that's a different communication technique that we might use when we're engaging our professional and our academic peers and colleagues. We apply our expertise to help others understand the issues that affect our world, as well as having conversations um, or creating accessible material for the public, whether that's through uh, our formal writings like journals, reports, recommendations, and white papers, um, as well as in our digital world, which has become increasingly more important in recent years through the internet and social media. Um, this webinar, uh, you'll hear from a group of science professionals who have presented science in a variety of different settings, which include the offices of Capitol Hill, um, the stage, um, and high school classrooms. We'll watch Liz Neely, uh, Executive Director at Story Collider, joined by two of my former UCS colleagues, uh, Dr. Dr. Andrea Beish, who is a Kendall Science Fellow working on food and agriculture at UCS, um, and Yogan Kothari, who is on our government affairs team for our Center for Science and Democracy. Um, while a Andrea and Yogan have since left UCS, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions specifically about the work that they mentioned, um, the topics they covered, and we'll do our best to get answers to your questions. A few things uh, I'd love folks to keep in mind uh, watching this video. Uh, this video was recorded some years ago, so there are things I wanted to make sure that were um, in the forefront of folks' minds while watching it. Um, the first is that lived expertise is unique and valuable. Um, Lived expertise can't be replicated in a lab. Um, it can't, we can't run numbers to create lived expertise. Um, the only way to find it is through folks who have lived, who have the lived expertise. The best experts for a lot of issues that affect the well-being of the public um, are folks who are have been directly, uh, who have directly experienced the impact of the problems that we're all working to solve. We know that. For example, um, harmful pollutants cause respiratory illnesses. We know that um, in communities that are closest to pollution promoting structures like major highways, chemical plants, and Superfund sites, um, a lot of those communities surrounding these structures are often low income, they're black and brown, and otherwise disenfranchised communities. We also know that members of Congress are often informed by constituents and activists. Um, members of Congress and their staff have often have meetings with constituents, um, activist groups, and coalitions to inform policy. Scientists also work at the local, state, and federal level to inform these policy decisions. UCS actually often plans lobby days in Washington, D.C., and at the state and local levels where um, activists and scientific experts mobilize around specific issues and often have the opportunity to meet with lawmakers themselves. And lastly, storytelling is a valuable tool in advocating for science. Um, stories are how we explain the impact of science advocacy, um, science communication, and science policy work. 
learning and keeping in mind the direct impacts that affect our planet from perspectives of those who understand them the most, whether that's professionally or personally, are an important component to advocating for sound, just science. Making that connection between our work, um, the science and our research, and the health and well being of our people um, is the main goal here. So I'm going to quickly, uh, I'm going to show you a webinar. It's about 30 minutes. Um, it's great. I hope you all enjoy. questions as possible. So today we have three presenters from various scientific backgrounds that will talk about how to present science in an, science in an engaging manner. First, we have Dr. Andrea Beish. Uh, Dr. Beish, uh, she's a Kendall Science Fellow here at UCS working on our Food and Environment Program. Dr. Beish's expertise is in sustainable agriculture and she truly is the epitome of concerned scientists. She'll be covering how to plan for your audience. Uh, next we have Yogan Kasari a Washington representative for the Center for Science and Democracy here at UCS as well. He's one of the few good lobbyists we have here in D.C. fighting to make sure that science is given its proper place in the political, in the political process. And he'll be talking about uh, how to turn scientific fact into policy. Finally, we have Liz Neely uh, with us, who is the executive director for Story Collider, a podcast featuring stories from scientists. Originally a marine biologist, she's a veteran of science communication and has hosted numerous training and workshops on this subject. And she will be talking uh, about incorporating storytelling. So at this point, you're probably tired of hearing me talk, so I'll take it then to uh, Dr. Beish uh, to begin the webinar. So enjoy, and I'll talk to you, Dr. Beish. Well, thank you, Justin. And thank you all for joining. Uh, as Justin said, I am a concerned scientist. I'm a research fellow here with the Food and Environment Program. So I'm an agricultural scientist. I study climate change impacts and how a more diverse agricultural system can reduce climate risks. So this photo on the left that you see is from my PhD research at Iowa State University, which was on cover crops and climate change. And while I was there, I was also part of the GK12 program, which was an initiative funded by the National Science Foundation in many states to integrated scientists into middle and high school classrooms. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. This photo on the right is from a soils demonstration that I did with my seventh graders uh, in Des Moines Public Schools that I worked with. And if they learned anything from me in that year, that for Ms. Beige, the agronomist, dirt was a four-letter word. It's because soil is alive and it's awesome. Okay, I digress. So I'll talk more about my seventh graders in a little bit because they're a nice case study of, of messaging and knowing your audience. So, Justin asked me to um, give the first part of today's webinar, and I'm hoping that you'll remember two main things from it. And those two things are really, for me, the answer to this question about how we simplify science communication without dumbing it down. But first, I want to ask all of you who are on the call just to reflect for a few moments on the last presentation you saw, whether it was at a conference, a seminar, a meeting. And I just want you to think about maybe what you remember. So I hope you can remember something from it, but just through that exercise, also thinking about, um, for me, what I want you to remember is that for effective, non-dumbed-down science communication, that it's really critical to focus on what are the main things that you want someone to remember from your presentation, your lesson, et cetera. And I use here on the left this Subway $5 footlong image because it's something that someone in a public speaking class that I took used, and it's just really stuck with me. So if you remember those commercials, I apologize if I'm getting that song back stuck in your head. Um, that they were super effective, that you can't watch those ads and not remember that the main message is that footlongs cost $5. So that's the first thing I'd like you to remember. And then the second um, is that it's really important to think strategically about who your audience is. And so this might all sound basic, but again, planning a main message and thinking about your audience in a really strategic, detailed way is going to help you simplify your communication without dumbing it down. And I'm not going to give you tons of specifics about what those details look like because I know that Liz and Yogan are going to help you with um, some more specific techniques to help fine tune your message. But I wanted to give you an overarching framework for how I answer this question and then share a few resources that might help you achieve these two points. 
Oh yeah, and I want to say this is not the Union of Concerned Scientists Food and Environment Team endorsing Subway, so don't go leaving here saying that. I'm just commenting that they had very effective marketing that I think helps in this context. So, when I was preparing for this presentation, I got very meta. This is a presentation about presentations, and I was thinking about the tools that can help you craft your message. I highly recommend, if you're not already using them, that you start to think about using them. And this is what you see here, um, what I use as a framework to think about what I wanted to convey on this webinar to you all today. And this uh, message box comes from the organization Compass. I've listed the URL here. Um, and it, this is meant to help scientists think through the so what, so what, why does my science matter? And the issue here that we're talking about today in the center is about simplifying a message without dumbing it down. And the problem, as I have assigned at the top, is that as scientists, we love complexity, we love details. But depending on the communication you're doing, you don't always have time for that. And so that requires strategery, it's a faux word that I love, and it requires planning, which can take time. And the solution at the bottom, as I've already talked about these two things I want you to remember, is that if you first focus on the main thing or a few things you want people to remember, and if you know your audience, that you'll be able to, and this is really the important part, to prioritize the details that are the most important. That's again, the so what. So if you're thinking about what your audience knows, what you want them to know, then that's going to really help you prioritize the most pertinent, uh, important details. And then as, as I've uh, shown on the left of the message box, the benefits here are that if you get into the habit of organizing your thoughts in this way or with some other similar resource, that you'll have that to draw upon for any host of professional needs like writing a grant proposal, giving your elevator pitch, et cetera. So I also wanted to show this as a tool to help you think about that other main point about who is your audience. And this template comes from communications expert Aaron Huertas, who was formerly with the Union of Concerned Scientists. His website is sciencecommunicationmedia.com, which has a lot of great resources. And he recently had a really nice blog post that I thought was really useful for this conversation about who is the general public. And he talked about in that post that this idea that uh, the general public and who they are is just kind of squishy anymore, that we're not in the old days of big TV and big print media, that there's a lot more diverse media outlets there and they allow us to be more targeted with our communication to reach specific audiences. And Aaron frames this um, as five main questions to start and then includes a few subcategories to help you think through these questions. And the first question is, who is your audience? And it can be appropriate, depending on your presentation, um, to identify a primary, a secondary, a tertiary audience. Um, what is your audience like? The second question, thinking about their values and beliefs that in some instances, it might be appropriate to lead with a values-based message that's still grounded in facts. I like question three also because it can help you focus the main messages that you want your audience to remember, what's your goal for the presentation, blog post, grant proposal, et cetera. And then questions four and five are more about planning a successful media or communications campaign. They're very useful. They're not necessarily as pertinent to today's talk. So I want to move on with the questions and just really quickly walk you through how I was strategic about who I thought the audience was, all of you on this webinar, and we close finally with two other communication examples. So my guess for who you are is that you are primarily scientists. There might be some community organizations or other policy folks who've joined the webinar. Um, oh, I also guess that they are, um, that you are content experts who value science policy and communication, that there might be more early career scientists. Question three, I imagine that you're probably very experienced already with communication and looking for tips and resources. And then finally, I guess that you're probably already using a range of media outlets. So you can let us know if I was right on all of those guesses about who the audience was for this webinar. So finally, I want to show you just two different examples of communication um, that I've tried with non-expert audiences um, and how I've tried to use these strategies to be effective. So um, the first is from the Union of Concerned Scientists blog. So I have written two blog posts on craft beer because I'm a big craft beer enthusiast and I think it's a nice way to reach our audience who for the blog we consider to be an educated but not expert group who are interested in some of the science issues that we work on here. And in my blog post I always try to make the main message apparent right at the front of it which here I have um, 
highlighted in the lead caption that uh, localizing the supply chain for craft beer, particularly barley, as I addressed in this post, is difficult. It takes time, research, and dedicated individuals. And so I, I did this with the thought that um, craft beer might be a nice hook to capture people's imagination and attention for those who care about local food, environmental sustainability. And given that I wanted them to understand some of the difficulties around localizing the supply chain for craft beer, it meant that I uh, prioritized digging into some specific details about barley management, common barley diseases, as well as malting chemistry. So if you're interested, you can take a look, see how well that I did there. And then finally, I want to close with one more example of thinking through your audience um, and main messages with my seventh graders. So this was a shot of a lesson that we did during our Earth Science Unit. I was pretty adamant about finding ways to infuse climate change basics with my students and felt like the carbon cycle was a really important concept to introduce them to. So basically in this activity, we labeled different tables with different pools of the carbon cycle. Each sheet had directions on it. You roll the dice, one through six, and that would tell you where to go and the process that got you there. So if you were moving from the atmosphere to a plant, that was happening via photosynthesis. And so the goal of this lesson was to get students to understand the movement of carbon through various sinks in the Earth system and that through post-discussion we would talk about how humans impact the carbon cycle with fossil fuel use. And I was always thinking about when I would plan a lesson, what are the one or two main things I wanted my students to remember because newsflash, seventh graders are not so different from adults in terms of the amount of information they're going to be able to retain in one short 50 minute sitting. Um, and that allowed me, when I, when I got there, was what were the main things that I could structure an activity in a way that be engaging. And knowing my audience as seventh graders, um, I knew they'd be more likely to pay attention if we had them up and moving around. So, as many of you may know, the Center for Science and Democracy has a strong desire to increase the quality of science and the use of science in decision making. And it's probably a desire that we all have in common. We often think if only legislators knew, you know, this is the science, these are the facts then they would make the right decision. But the idea of people thinking that facts change minds is really a zombie in science communication and really a zombie in dealing with uh, making your science used by policymakers. So we really have to be aware that there's a lot of different things that folks take into account, including cultural values, political calculations, economic interests, and other considerations that all ultimately uh, factor into the decision making. But what policymaking and influencing policymakers comes down to really is human relationships. And it really requires some time, dedication, patience, and mutual trust. It also requires us to find ways to meaningfully connect with one another, and it requires everyone to respect different viewpoints. Also, it's really important for us to understand context and add value. And most importantly, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is we have to listen. We can't just have a one-off meeting with someone and then get back in touch with them when we need something else. We need to consistently connect with mutual interests and build that trust over time. And we have to give up being, quote, right, and need to find values that can really resonate among the person that we're trying to influence and want to do, uh, want to carry on our work. Remember that some of, the, some of the same facts to us might mean different things to different people. So you have all kinds of targets, right? From a local mayor to a city planner to a state governor, state agency leader to your member of Congress. Um, and, you know, these are all really folks you need to really be building a relationship with. And you might really be surprised at the influence you can have on someone, especially someone that represents you. Uh, when you vote in someone's district and you let an elected official or representative know that you are their constituent, it's really a great way to get their attention. And I cannot emphasize that enough. As a voter, you have a lot more influence than you think, and it's just not at the ballot box, but it's also in the office of, of the people that represent you and in the halls of Congress and everywhere else. So while it's obviously really important to engage, uh, the other thing I just want to flag is that while it's important to engage with decision makers, it's also really important to engage with other stakeholders as well uh, within the community like local faith groups, uh, Rotary Club, and other community leaders as well. So just keeping that in mind when you're uh, doing your policy member engagement, keeping in mind what the other stakeholders are is really important. So I'm going to get into the how, right? Uh, how do you prepare for your meetings? Um, how, as a scientist, can you really talk up without talking down? Uh, what is the best way to engage decision makers, many who, have, who don't have a science background, which is really important to keep in mind, 
to understand your science and work with Paul, uh, that your science uh, should, should uh, matter. So my first tip is to prepare well for the meetings. There are things that you should always know. You should know who the, the, like, who the member is, what, what their story is, who their allies are, who are their opponents, and what issues they care about. Basically, do your homework. This is pretty easy to do. You can, you can check it out um, on their website. Usually all members of Congress have a long bio on their website. You can always start at the Wikipedia page as well and then go and find the actual resources after that. Um, it's really important to understand how they got there because sometimes you know, they, they have odd career paths and then you might be able to find something else to connect with that person. Um, so like I said, checking out that personal or campaign website is really important and also going to the recent press releases. That's what something I like to do before I go into a meeting is to see what they're talking about right now and see what they care about right now. The, ne the next point I want to make is you know, have a main message. I think you know, Dr. Bash really touched on this as well, but you know, what is your main message? What is the relevance of what you are asking for? It's not necessarily telling people what to care about, but it's also about understanding what people already value and then using your science to find common ground with them. Uh, the next point is don't simplify things. Uh, you know, provide some context, provide, uh, look, look at someone's values and see what they care about, and present your science so it can resonate with that person. Sometimes, you know, when you talk about climate change, for example, it's not that climate change isn't, isn't what's, gonna, what's gonna really move them, but if you talk to them about the impacts of the changing weather and sea level rise, they might be more interested in listening to you because it impacts their business or their home or something like that. So keeping that in mind and respecting that person's point of view is also just as important. Understanding the context that they have to make the decisions in because like I said earlier, the same facts will mean different things to different people. And if you're going with a few colleagues, make sure you practice and determine what your roles are when you're, when you're, uh, before you have the meeting, because it's really important to, to have, have, a, have, have, a, have a way to go when you're practicing your pitch. So during the meeting, there's uh, a couple things that I really urge uh, scientists that I work with to keep in mind. Having no more than three key points is the first. Sometimes when you, when you have a lot of different asks, People get confused, they get overwhelmed, they don't know what to focus on. So narrowing down what you want to talk about to three key points is important. Tailor your points to the person that you are speaking with and then focus on what's practical and what's doable. It's really critical to focus on practical solutions and not focus on unattainable ideals. For example, we've recently been working with a scientist here and on our science work, uh, Dr. Travis is pictured in this picture with me. Uh, we were hiking recently uh, in Wisconsin uh, at the Society for Conservation Biology Conference. And, you know, we were chatting and we were talking about um, this work we're doing around the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, where Dr. Travis reached out to members of the Science Network. Some of you guys have, uh, may have seen his email back last December uh, asking Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, he wanted folks to sign on to a petition to ask Fish and Wildlife Service to improve the be how they use best available science in the listing and delisting process. And after that, we had conversations internally with Adrian on you know what are some things that we can do that are actual practicable asks, a practical ask of the agency, and then what are some uh, pie in the sky asks, and then we really wanted to uh, work with him to focus on the things that we know we can get done, and we can make that make the incremental change that we desire, instead of focusing on the pie in the sky ask that would that would require just a huge change, and we know that wasn't attainable. So while we didn't totally remove that from our conversations with the agency, we also had an understanding of what was what we could do and what we couldn't do. Now, you know, uh, using data is really important. I think I saw a question come through about about you know how can we make our data resonate? And data is important, but even more important is the power of the story. So I really urge folks to tell a good story and tell a good anecdote. Sometimes just weaving in a human interest element is even better. Um, it really captures someone's attention and it's really easy for someone to understand a, a story rather than some data on an Excel spreadsheet or whatever. So that's really important as well. Um, the other thing I'd keep in mind is plain English. Now, what I mean by that is that, you know, oftentimes we're talking and we talk in technical jargon. I myself do the same thing when I talk in, you know, and mention the alphabet, alphabet soup of government agencies um, or government acronyms and the folks you guys are talking to you may not understand the scientific jargon like uncertainty, levels of confidence, and things like that. So make sure you're explaining that in, in a simpler way so that folks can understand who don't have a scientific background. Presenting options is just as important as well. Present potential options available as a result of your work as well as the consequences of their policy actions. 
you don't want them to think about it. And if you frame it in the context of your conversation, you get a head start and you show them that you are well prepared and are thinking about potential impacts and helping them think through the problems that they might face uh, to move a policy forward. Uh, the lead behind is also important. You know, having a one pager that really breaks down your three key points for them is, is, is just an easy way for them to remember you and then you can always follow up with that one pager with more information over email. Um, and listen, right, make sure you take some time in that conversation to listen to the folks that you're talking to and figure out what their concerns are as well so you can better uh, communicate with them. Now, stay in touch. Don't lose contact. Like I said, it's all about human relationships and whether or not they move forward with your ideas, it's important for you to just make sure that they know that, you're, that you can be a resource for them. As I said earlier, engaging with the policymakers is all about relationships and you can't just fly in and have a conversation whenever you feel like it. If you develop a strong relationship, they will begin to see you as a resource and ally and proactively reach out to you when they have a question that deals with your expertise. Drop by the office, attend events, write to, write to the office, or even call a staffer. Attend their community events. It's really important if you want to communicate your science to the policymaker. Sometimes there may not just be a policy ask, and that's totally okay. They, just having a conversation about your work is important for someone to understand the value of what you do and why it matters. So in the future, if a related issue comes up, you can be that resource. But you should always try to have some takeaway when engaging with a decision maker, whether it be, hey, I just want you to know, uh, I just want to get to know you better, I just want you to know what I'm doing, what I'm working on, and why it matters, or hey, I want you to take this policy action because this is what, what my science tells me. Um, look forward to answering all your guys' questions, so thanks. All right, thank you, Yogan. Um, so now, uh, as Yogan kind of alluded to, it's really powerful to have a story to go along with your scientific data. So we brought in Liz Neely from uh, Story Collider to kind of talk about um, incorporating storytelling into your presentation. So Liz, would you like to take it away? Thank you. I really appreciate this setup for this talk. I, I spent the past decade of my life working at Compass, teaching the message docs and helping connect scientists to journalists and policymakers. So I feel like the grounding that you've already gotten puts you in good stead for this next step. I, um, I tweeted a confession earlier today, which that storytelling used to make me really uncomfortable. Even early in my, well into my science communication career, I had a negative reaction to it. And I think this is for a couple of different reasons. One, it felt like a buzzword that was overused. And two, I was still carrying baggage from my grad school years. So storytelling, sometimes we associate it with either like campfire stories or children's stuff, but particularly damning in a science context, it's this feeling that if your data is not strong enough, you engage in a little bit of you know, hand waving to jazz it up. So there's some kind of distrust or insecurity around this and, and also the specter that it might somehow be manipulative because it deliberately seeks to create an emotional connection and reaction from your audience. So I was exactly the kind of person who would have been tweeting negatively as I saw some people doing over the weekend. This was a story that was number one on the Atlantic Magazine's website for all of the weekend and has been sitting up there, it's wrapped up more than 500,000 views. And scientists were saying, ugh, the human interest story, I don't want to hear this background. So I was in exactly that same boat. Um, I, studied off, I started off studying evolution, color patterns and visual systems in tropical reef fish. But the way that I found legitimacy in this, the way I personally connected to it, and what I was most proud of was represented in slides like this. And I actually, and I apologize to these poor people, when I thought I needed to come up with an elevator speech, I kid you not, I said, oh, what do I study? I study the synonymous to non-synonymous substitution ratios in the transmembrane regions of rhodopsins and rafids. You know, it nailed it. Um, what I didn't understand then was that it wasn't just the jargon that was my problem. It was that I wasn't explaining what I was doing and why it mattered. There was no connection, no meaning behind the information that I was trying to present. And luckily for me, in my graduate work, I was studying exactly some of these concepts in animal communication that would serve me well as I made a transition into understanding why this stuff matters. There's a German word called Umwelt, 
And it means like imagine what the world looks like to a bumblebee that can see in the ultraviolet or to an animal that can sense magnetic fields. The world exists for each species, the way that it is processed through their sensory system and processed by their cognitive architecture. So understanding the world as it is, is experienced by other people was my way in. And I think this is really crucially important given the political climate and the heightened rhetoric we see right now about the culture of wars around science and science under attack. And you look at the way people are positioned as heroes or villains um, and the narratives that we're starting to tack onto this. I really encourage you to read the cover issue of National Geographic early last year called The War on Science. And in it, I and others are hammering home the points that we've been trying to teach in science communication for so long. I also hope you read this because this magazine almost ruined my life, given that in addition to all the incredible data I was presenting around science communication, it ended up being the story I told about my conservative Republican father and his resistance to the ideas of climate change that ended in this piece. Things have gone well with that and gotten better. But what I think is most important for people to understand is that for a long time we thought, oh, um, like, like Yogan said, facts change minds. We know that this is not true. We know this is a zombie idea. And that's simply throwing more data at people who are already resistant or apathetic can not only not change their mind or improve the state of affairs, but can cause entrenchment or even boomerang effects. But I think perhaps the pendulum has swung a little too far the, in the other direction where we think everyone sees the world solely through their ideological lenses and that there's this horrible sort of anti-science sentiment in the US right now. So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Dan Kahan, if you don't already know him. He's at Yale University, and he conceptualizes what he calls the science communication measurement problem. So I'll tell a short story, and we'll start in the world of climate change. So knowing what you know about the U.S. and how polarized climate change is as a topic, this is what you would expect to see, and this is what the data holds up, that if you map out across the ideological spectrum how concerned people are about the risk that climate change poses to human health and well-being. Those who tend to be very liberal, strong Democrats see a lot of risk. Those who tend to be very conservative, strong Republicans report very little risk. And everybody sort of along that spectrum maps out as you would expect, and there's a strong regression line. So this is an illustration of a case in which political identity strongly dictates the way that people perceive risks in a science communication problem. The challenge is to remember that this is a pathology, as Dan terms it. It is not representative of the vast majority of issues in which scientific input into the policy process and public decision making can be quite valued. So here is an example of some of the many other fields in which you do not see that same strength of political polarization. One of my favorite papers, so I read a lot of the social science, risk perception psychology about storytelling. And one of my favorite papers has a line in there that says, people are storytelling machines. We engage in a virtually uninterrupted inner monologue to make sense of our world. And so when your monologue is asking about trust, this is what I point you to. Dan arguing that members of the public do trust science is that culturally opposing groups distrust each other when they perceive that they're at risk. This means that we have to be thinking about ourselves not only in terms of the strength and clarity of our messaging, but also in perhaps our own roles as messengers or storytellers and the partnerships that it might be productive to create. The most important thing I've learned about storytelling since I joined the Story Collider is that stories are both products of and processes that enable us to engage in the incredible human need to resolve ambiguity, to attribute blame or reward, and to make meaning out of information. Stories are always 
an interplay between the audience, the storyteller, and the content of the story itself. And so this means that not only are different people hearing the different words that we're saying in different ways, they're interpreting it through their worldview, they're judging you as the, as the messenger, and you should be adapting on the fly. But what I hope you understand and the reason you're on this kind of webinar is that you understand it's a false dichotomy to presume that we can either present you know, rigorous data or we can tell compelling stories. The best available information to us is telling us that from all these different lines of research, all these different social science, neuroscience, psychology fields, that stories are seem to be encoded and processed using a different cognitive pathway from other kinds of argumentation, like evidence-based argumentation or other forms of rhetoric. And overall, they are more engaging. People are more likely to pay attention to you. They're more comprehensible so people understand what is being conveyed. They, they're found to be more plausible so people believe them much more. And particularly in dealing with skeptical or resistant audiences, stories, even when they are um, labeled as fictional, are persuasive. So people form ideas, they shift their attitudes, and they bring those back to the real world. This is the point in which I really want to make a very strong and clear demarcation to make sure that you're clear on your own goals. Because since stories are powerful, we have an ethical obligation to use them well. And I do think it's a, it's a danger to conflate advocacy agendas with science communication. So there are a number of papers I would point you to, work by, led by John Besley and Anthony Dudo, um, work by Roger Pokey, paper by Simon Donner, on understanding what is your ultimate goal. Is it to <laughs> persuade, is it to move people to action, and then to behave accordingly. In the last minute or so of my talk, I'll just point to one example of the ways in which really kind of digging into the storytelling world might help you design more persuasive communication. So this is uh, a little infographic I put together based on some formative papers. Um, if your goal, for example, is persuasion, what we understand from decades worth of studying how audiences engage with stories, both in film format and live storytelling, is that there's a this technical jargon term, transportation, for the feeling of being swept into a story. And we can actually measure that, and we know that transportation strongly influences persuasion. So the more people are swept into that world of the story, the more likely they are to bring those attitudes back. So then the question becomes, well, how do you encourage that transportative state or strengthen it in the kind of storytelling that you're doing? There are two um, sort of supporting elements here. One is called intensive processing, which means people are having a strong emotional experience. And then the second is called uncritical processing, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're turning their logical brains off, but rather that they're not being yanked out of the story world by inconsistencies or things that set up red flags for them. And so then you can continue to go into the scientific literature and look for all the qualities that are called narrativity qualities that strengthen or impede intensive and uncritical processing. So this is kind of the wonky stuff that delights me. I came into this world of storytelling because I was following my nose. I wanted to see the data. I wanted to understand why this works. But in closing, I just wanted to say, if you're looking for advice on how to do this authentically and how to do this ethically, which is so important, one place to start is with this paper by Michael Dahlstrom and Shirley Howell about ethical considerations. And most importantly, I would say to members of the scientific community, we need to tell our own stories of the research we're involved in. And whenever we're telling the stories of stakeholders or other people, we have to be careful that they are included and involved in this too, or else we risk misunderstanding and misappropriating the story. So in closing, I'd like to share this Arthur Ashe quote with you that we all use. Start where you are. Think about the stories at your disposal. Use what you have. What are your own authentic experiences? 
and do what you can. Storytelling is a powerful tool. I think it's a danger that when you've got a really big hammer, everything looks like a nail. I don't think you want to walk into every policy setting and say, let me tell you a story. But you can use these tools to be memorable, to be understandable, and to make a difference. If you'd like to hear examples of this, as uh, you heard before from Justin, Story Collider has a podcast. We also have regular shows in New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and in London as well. Thank you. All right. All right. So um, thanks for watching our webinar. Um, we'll engage in discussion in a little bit. Uh, but first, um, of course, if you have any questions about the webinar and any specific things that Andrea Liz or Yogan mentioned, um, feel free to reach out to me and I can get you an answer. So before we open the floor for discussion, uh, I wanted to show you all this structure. Um, it's Compliments of Compass, um, the organization that uh, Liz works for, uh, that champ it champions, connects, and supports diverse science leaders to improve the well-being of people in nature. Uh, this is an exercise that you can practice on your own. It's a great tool for crafting messaging that focuses on the goals of mobilizing and engaging around an issue. So I'll quickly go through the pieces of this uh, message box. So first, um, of course, we need to know who our audience is. Um, we also need an issue. We need something to focus on. So um, an example we can use is climate change. Climate change and how it affects the environment and public health. So then problems. What are some problems that this issue, is ca issue causes? We know that the effects of climate change have caused rising temperatures and decreased air quality in the warmer months. We know that this increases the risks of illnesses associated with heat and stroke. It also can cause an overload of the power grid and deterioration of natural habitats in our overall ecosystem. So what, why should we care? Climate change impacts the environment and public health. We wanna reduce the impacts that climate change has on health, infrastructure, resilience, and overall safety. So next we wanna know solutions. What can I do? Folks wanna know what part can they play in all of this? We can play a part in informing federal, state, and local policies that strengthen emission standards, make greater investments in renewable energy, invest more in infrastructure and resilience to address rising sea levels, and natural disaster preparedness, and improving workplace standards for workers that are most impacted by rising temperatures. And lastly, we want to know how we can benefit from working to solve this issue. Of course, in the long term, mitigation the causes, mitigating the causes of climate change and addressing our preparedness to protect folks from the effects better suits us from or better suits us in the long run, long run and helps us prevent further disruption to the ecosystems, um, less endangered species, better air quality, um, a reduction in health problems caused by um, climate change. So next, um, we can hop into a group discussion. There are a few polls in the Whova platform um, that I encourage you all to take a look at and vote in um, at some point today if you haven't already. Um, I saw some responses in there already. That's really great. Um, but I want to hear from you all. Um, as we know, storytelling is an important part of learning about science advocacy. Um, what are some audiences that maybe you all are interested in engaging about or engaging in your work? And or maybe what are some stories that you might have to share with others about your work today? So um, opening the floor for any questions. Uh, uh, Chelsea, is that? format okay if folks, um, or how should folks uh, signal if they want to say a thing? Uh, they can write it in the chat. I think they can also uh, raise their hand and are mute. 
So um, Ben, you can uh, unmute and you can ask your question. I see that your hand is raised. Yes, thank you very much uh, to our speaker. Great webinar and on a very important subject. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I, I know and I agree with you that it's important for us to amplify the voice of science. Uh, but as I look at the world, it seems to me as though we may find ways to dim the voice of uh, the political world. Uh, because in many countries, they are given lots of, 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 uh, of audience and they're not necessarily right. Whereas as we try to magnify science, we are almost competing again as the voice of political leadership. Do you have uh, any suggestions of how we can not only engage, but sometimes uh, find ways to diminish <laughs> their voice or will, will it be uh, where we compete for audiences and we try to be the best we can with, with our voices? Absolutely. And that's a difficult challenge. I think we even have here in the States. Sometimes um, certain narratives can take over. It's very easy to, um, to read something somewhere, especially with misinformation and disinformation going on. Um, social media makes that easier. Somebody can write something and post it. Um, thousands of people see it. It becomes a thing. Um, so I think uh, the, the best we can do is offering the facts um, backing up those facts with science, so science-based um, science-based facts. So we want evidence um, showing, you know, the truth of the matter. But also, we want to make sure that we're connecting that to real life, where we're connecting that to how it affects people. Because people, um, people that are suffering for one reason or another, whether it's for because of um, environmental changes or um, public health issues or lack of access to education, lack of access to proper medical care, for example. Um, these are the parts of the story that we want to make sure that we're bringing at the forefront because oftentimes um, folks are just not, um, they're not adequately educated in an issue enough to really fight for themselves. And it's hard to describe something. It's hard to mobilize folks for something that you don't quite understand on this granular level. And if you're not a person who is a scientist or reads journals or writes journals for a living, um, you know, sending people scientific journals is not always going to be the thing that makes the compelling argument. Um, so yes, I appreciate that question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you too. Any other questions or things folks want to bring up, um, things that stood out in the training? All right. I'm hearing none. Um, I want to point you all again uh, to some of the polls that some of the polls that we um, that we shared here. Just a second. A lot of windows. <laughs> right. So, uh, of course, one of the polls looks like one audience uh, that folks, a couple audiences that folks would like to engage with. I see microbiologists, non scientists, and policymakers, school children, uh, people who are involved in making national level policies, students, researchers. So, I see a lot of experts, which is great. Um, because that's also how we can spread the knowledge, right? Like we're talking to other experts about their part, the part that they can play. So that's great. 
Um, other things that would help you feel more confident in exploring science advocacy. Oh, I see a question. Um, how can you join UCS? Uh, thanks for asking that. Um, you can become a member of UCS by visiting our website at ucsusa.org. Um, and you can also join the Science Network by visiting um, ucsusa.org slash science network. And my information, you can also reach me. Uh, my information is in the Hoover platform as well. All right. If there aren't any more questions, um, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for joining me this morning. Uh, this has been great. Um, it's an honor to be here. I um, hope you have a great rest of your day of, of Dawson. sessions. Dawson, I just want yes. to send thank you for your time and for the great presentation. On behalf of God, we want to express our gratitude to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, everyone. I hope to see you at the next session, which is how to write a policy brief in four minutes. Thank you again, Tosin.